together. Get the first one on. <laughs> All No. No.
Nothing. Oh, there's somebody. Hello. Hi. <clears throat> we were starting to wonder if we were having one today. Well, um, a little late, I guess. Well, it's just us so far. Oh, really? Well, hi, yeah. Miss Elizabeth. Hi, how are you? Not too shabby. How about you? Just fine. Well, where is everybody? I don't know. <laughs> Good grief. One day at a time. So. Well. That's a pretty, is that a shirt you have on? Uh-huh. It's awful it's like pretty. These shirts. Not an Astros, though. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty sad. Uh-huh. I really thought they'd go all the way this time. I know. I know. Can't imagine. I don't know. One time it is fine, and the next time it is yuck. <laughs> well, if you want to talk yuck, Look at the Texans. <laughs> they are pathetic. I didn't, uh, I, good. Uh, I don't know. Uh, well, they're uh, terrible. Good. They're just terrible. I think they've won out of eight or nine games, they've won one game. Oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah, they're just awful. What was funny is the week that they played, um, can't think of the name of the team, but J.J. Watts was on the other team, you know, and I thought that was really funny. Of course, they beat him, you know, <laughs> Watts. <laughs> oh, there's Sue. Sue's. Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Well, we'll see. Yes. You and me and one person, then not anybody else. <laughs> not even our priest. <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, you and me, me and uh, good talking. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Suits, can you hear me? I don't know.
Good morning. Hi, how are you? Good. How's everybody? Good. Good. Fun. Good. So is it just going to be a ladies event today? I don't know. Looks like it's me and Teddy and Elizabeth and maybe a Susie Creator. I don't know if she's going to join us. All right. So how is everybody? Just fine. Awesome. Good. Awesome. Awesome. Yay. What's new? Nothing. I got up this morning. <laughs> <laughs> That's like half the battle, isn't it? I'll tell you what. <laughs> That is a battle some mornings, isn't it? Well, after the coffee, it's better. I agree. Do you make fresh coffee every day? I, I have the Keurig. Oh, do you? Yeah. And, do you like the uh, Keurig? That's all I ever want is that one cup in the morning, and that's all the coffee I drink all day. Yeah, that's how I am, too. I just want yeah, that I one in the morning. Too. Well, what about you, Miss Elizabeth? Do you? Uh, one. Just one? Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, there I am. We're just talking about all the coffee we drink in the one day. Do you, are you a big coffee drinker? Yeah, one cup. Yeah, that, <laughs> that's where we're all landing to, just one. Yeah. Do you grind yours? <sighs> no, I have a... a espresso machine oh. so i have one of those nespresso so oh like you do the heavy duty stuff huh well they do it for me <laughs> <laughs> oh that's awesome that's great i do like super coffee though what's that uh you can pick it up at heb it's got uh nutrients and protein added to it it's pretty good yeah. <laughs> awesome Wow. Well, there you go. Well, it looks like it's just going to be a bunch of us ladies together today, which is fine by me. You called me a lady. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> so before we get started, have we any prayer requests for today? I think mine's the same, Tom and Sue and Alice. I was about to ask you, how how are they doing? Okay, they're hanging in there. Yeah. I guess Good Shepherd is aware of all of that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Good. Hanging in, huh? Mm-hmm. I take it as the uh, same is true for Miss Alice? uh yeah okay she's kind of making a response to some therapy so that's good oh good yeah that's always encouraging she's made a rubber she always bounces back to some degree well and um steph is probably getting ready to go take another round of treatment yeah she goes at eight o'clock in the morning Oh, she does at eight. Why did I Every think day at eight? eight. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does, so she's already does had. It take, does it take long to do? Is it? Actually, she didn't say. Um, she, she was home by lunch, so. Um, she didn't feel bad either. Well, that was yesterday. I don't know. <laughs> right. But, well, her first treatment, she didn't feel bad. So. You know, she says she looks like the tattooed lady. So. Oh. But so far, so good. Any others? Okay, well, um, let us um, pray for um, those that are close to us in our hearts and those that need to be lifted up to God. Um, believing and knowing that God hears us when we do pray. The Lord be with you. And also with you. 
in loving God, we give you thanks again for another day of coming together, of learning and growing together, Lord. God, I pray that in this time of studying, Lord, that our hearts would be settled, our souls would be settled, and our minds would be open. Lord, we pray that whatever is, whatever we are carrying, whatever is burdening our hearts and minds, we would be able to release that. God, our hearts are heavy for Tom and Sue and Alice, and we know that you are guiding and directing all of that, everything that needs to be done medically, as well as with families. I know the dynamics are hard in times of duress and stress, and I pray your peace, Lord. Pray also for Stephanie and ask, Lord, that um, your peace would be with her and Huey, also their daughters, Emily and Shannon, as they move through this time. I pray they know how much um, Grace loves them and that we will be with them and support them. Yes, I want to make a reservation. We also, do it online, but it's not we also pray for um, Patrick McDermott, who's about to undergo heart surgery. I'm sorry, what? And ask your peace for him as well. Lord, we give this time to you, and we pray all in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus. Amen. 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 Okay. So tell me, where did we like leave off last week? I don't know. You don't Sorry. know. So I have it at building the tabernacle in chapter 36. Is that where? Yeah. About, I gotta go get my Bible slash iPad. Okay. Verse eight or so. Is that where? Right. Oh, Stephanie just texted and says, Jesus took the wheel today. She's texted what? Jesus took the wheel today. Let's say. Hopefully that's a good thing. All right. Susie? Yes? Steph just texted and said Jesus took the wheel today. <laughs> so I take that's a good thing? Sounds like it. Yeah, okay. We're going to just say um, that's a good thing. Yeah. She gave it up. <laughs> she gave it up, I guess. Yeah. All right, so we are essentially kind of going back. This might feel a bit familiar because um, this particular section where we're headed to, it's, it's the beginning of a really long section and it goes almost to the end of the book of Exodus. Um, so remember the, the the tabernacle was previously described in Exodus. We've already kind of read through that in, in chapters 26 through 31. Remember, mm -hmm. this kind of may sound like a repeat. Mm -hmm. um, so this is the um, listing of the specifications which have already been given prior in Exodus 26 through 31, okay? So any, you know, just like a, an architect pours over his blueprints before something is built, this is kind of like the recounting um, um, of, a, you know, a, a priest would have been extremely thrilled to have seen the, the relisting of the specifications that are poured out from now until almost the end of Exodus. So this is like a double take. If you missed it the first time, guess what, guys? We get to do it all over again, okay? All right. 
Um, so let's just kind of, we'll maybe read until I feel like we can talk about it and then let's break it up in that way. We don't have to read the whole chapter, but um, we'll read until we have something to talk about, okay? All right, so let's start on um, verse eight of chapter 36 in Exodus. And we talked about who is doing all of this work. It's the skilled artisans, right? Um, those from among the Israelite people who have been gifted by God, they are the ones who have been enlisted to help in this process again. All the skilled artisans among those doing the work made the tabernacle with tin curtains. Belzebel made them of finely spun linen as well as blue, purple, and scarlet yarn with the design of cherubim worked into them. Each curtain was 42 feet long, six feet wide. All the curtains had the same measurements. He joined five of the curtains to one another and the other five curtains he joined to each other. He made loops of blue yarn on the edge of the last curtain in the first set and did the same on the edge of the outermost curtain on the second set. He made 50 loops on the one curtain and 50 loops on the edge of the curtain in the second set so that the loops lined up with one another. He also made 50 gold clasps and joined the curtains to each other so that the tabernac tabernacle became a single unit. Okay, so that's what's important. Everything was joined because it was it's one, one fell swoop, one big piece of fabric, it sounds like, right? Mm -hmm. He made curtains of goat hair, well, we've seen that before, for a tent over the tabernacle. He made 11 of them. Each curtain was 45 feet long and six feet wide. All 11 curtains had the same measurements. He joined five of the curtains together and the other six together. He made 50 loops on the edge of the outermost curtain of the first set and 50 loops on the edge of the corresponding curtain in the second set. He made 50 bronze clasps to join the tent together as a single unit. He also made a covering for the tent from ram skins dyed red and a covering of fine leather on top of it. Okay. So we have some pretty explicit directions here, don't we? Yeah. Okay. I'm not sure. Um, I'm not really sure about like giving a lot of commentary on it other than um, remember when God wants something to be done, is it going to be done in a haphazard manner? No. No. no, there's always going to be a set of instructions that go with it. And we are seeing here, the instructions are very exact, huh? And it looks like the skilled artisans are following them. Uh -huh. Down from, I mean, from the colors to the choice of hair to um, the amount of loops, you would say like, who cares about loops? Why does there have to be 50 on one side and 50 on the other side? Well. Why? That's what God instructed, right? Mm -hmm. So if God instructs it, we're going to make it happen. And who's uh -huh. going to do that again? It's going to be the skilled artisans up in here, right? <clears throat> okay, so we've seen the ram skins dyed red before. And then we have the badger skins above that. So a lot of these same things we have seen before. Okay. So let's continue on. He made upright supports of acacia wood for the tabernacle. Each support was 15 feet long and 27 inches wide. So some pretty big supports there, huh? Each support had two ten tenons for joining one to another. He did the same for all the supports of the tabernacle. He made supports for the tabernacle as follows, 20 for the south, and he made 40 silver bases to put under the 20 supports, 20, two bases under the first support for its tenons and two bases under each of the following supports for their two tenons. For the second side of the tabernacle, the north side, he made 20 supports with the, their 40 silver bases, two bases under the first support and two bases under each of the following ones. And for the back of the tabernacle on the west side, he made six supports. He also made two additional supports for the two back corners of the tabernacle. They were paired at the bottom and joined together at the top in a single ring. 
this is what he did with both of them for the two corners. So there were eight supports with their 16 silver bases, two bases under each one. Clear as mud? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. All right. So I guess they needed boards on all sides of the tabernacle and a way to hold them together. So, and what are these boards made out of? Acacia wood, right? Lots of acacia wood. Um, and all of the acacia wood was to be overlaid with gold. And the rings are to be made of gold and overlaid with bars of gold. And we're gonna find that out in verses 31 through 34. He made five crossbars of acacia wood for the supports on each side of the tabernacle, five crossbars for the supports on the other side of the tabernacle, and five crossbars for those at the back of the tabernacle on the west. He made the central crossbar run through the middle of the supports from one end to the other. He overlaid them with gold and made their rings out of gold as holders for the crossbars. He also overlaid the crossbars with gold. Remember um, on, in Sunday's sermon, I talked about how um, in the actual temple, when Herod built the temple in Jerusalem, how he overlaid it with so much gold that if uh -huh. you were in the sun, you had the potential of blinding yourself because there was so much gold on this building. So this harkens back, um, um, even in the tabernacle, the movable temple, there was lots of gold. And that was transferred to the actual building of the, the temple. Okay, continuing on, verse 35. Then he made the curtain with blue, purple, and scarlet yarn. So those seem to be the color of choice, right? We're always going to see that blue, purple, and scarlet. And finally, spun linen. He made it um, with the design of the cherubim worked into it. He made four pillars of acacia wood for it and overlaid them also with gold. Their hooks were of gold and he cast four silver bases for the pillars. He made a screen embroidered with blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and finely spun linen for the entrance to the tent. Together with, the, with its five pillars and their hooks, he overlaid the tops of the pillars and their bands with gold, but their five bases were bronze. So we have the theme of the same colors. We have the cherubim showing up. We have the pillars made of acacia and laden with gold. The screen for the tabernacle door was made of blue, purple, and scarlet thread. Mm. And um, we also have the mention of linen, which um, was probably woven by a very skilled weaver. weaver. Um, and also, um, all of that was overladen with gold and bronze. So, what do you guys think of um, this building of the tabernacle so far? Complicated. Yeah. Yeah. Big. Sounds, what's that? <laughs> Big. Big and complicated. Yeah. yeah. That's a lot of work. A ton of work. And it's um it's so specific, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, God just wants it. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's right. And um, you know, it's interesting. We see kind of the same instructions. We see the same um, colors being used. We see, you know, linen and fine yarn being used. Um, but all of it, again, like you say, Elizabeth, it's done in an orderly way. It's done in a way that's laid out very um, instruction heavy, right? Uh -huh. but we also know that these people <coughs> are a stiff necked people. And so instructions are really good for people mm -hmm. who like to wander and for people who don't really pay attention very well. <laughs> now, I could be reading into that. I'm not saying, I mean, that just happens to be my own personal belief. I think when things are repeated in scripture more than once, especially detailed instructions like this, 
it's not an accident. It could have just been said one time, but the biblical authors thought it wise enough or smart enough. Okay, we're going to do it all over again. Uh -huh. These instructions are specific, but it is a reinforcement of um, this is what God expects. And also remembering the people to whom he's speaking about and their history. And their history is one that um, they like to do what they like to do, right? <laughs> but don't we all? Yeah. Okay, let's keep going on with um, chapter 37. And this begins our building of the tabernacle furniture. So remember, a tabernacle isn't just a big empty room, is it? It has a number of very, very important things in it, right? So um, the outside is constructed essentially to protect the precious inside furniture um, that are objects of devotion and worship for God. Okay, so let's first of all see um, Making of the Ark, chapter 37. This is the furniture of the most holy place. Belzel made the Ark of Acacia wood, 45 inches long. Okay, so what is that, like four feet long? Um, 27 inches wide and 27 inches high. He overlaid it, surprise, surprise, with pure gold inside and out and made a gold molding all around it. He cast four gold rings for it for its four feet, two rings on one side and two rings on the other side. He made poles of acacia wood and overlaid them also with gold. He inserted the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark for carrying the ark. He made a mercy seat of pure gold. 45 inches long and 27 inches wide. He made two cherubim of gold. He made them of hammered work at the end, the two ends of the mercy seat, one cherub at one end and one cherub at the other end. At each end, he made a cherub of one piece with the mercy seat. They wings spread out, the face that they faced each other and covered the mercy seat with their wings. The faces of the cherubim were looking towards the mercy seat. Okay, so we have the actual ark and he made the mercy seat. Um, so we've got a lot of gold going on. We've got a lot of cherubim going on, don't we? <clears throat> What else kind of sticks out in your mind? So essentially we have the ark is now made. Mm -hmm. Okay, So the mercy seat um, is essentially the ark of the covenant. Okay. So the next thing that we're going to construct is the table of the showbread. And remember it has utensils that go with it. He's constructed the table again of acacia wood, 36 inches long, 18 inches wide and 27 inches high. He overlaid it with pure gold and made a gold molding all around it. He made a three inch frame all around it and made a gold molding all around it and made a gold molding all around its frame. He cast four gold rings for it and attached the rings to the four corners at its four legs. The rings were next to the frame as holders for the poles to carry the table. He made the poles for carrying the table from acacia wood and overlaid them with gold. He also made the utensils that would be on the table out of pure gold. Its plates and cups as well as its bowls and pitchers for pouring drink offerings. Okay, just more instructions on the table um, for the showbread, which is um, our modern day, what would that be likened in our worship space? It would be the altar, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's constructed now as well as all of the accoutrements um, for pouring out drink offerings and making drink offerings. So everything is constructed 
so that worship can happen on the table. All of it being made of, again, of acacia wood and gold. Next, we will make the lampstand. Then he made the lampstand out of pure hammered gold. Sure is a lot of gold going on in there. Mm -hmm. He made it in all, all, he made it all in one piece, its base and shaft, its ornamental cups and its buds and petals. Six branches extended from its sides, three branches of the lampstand from one side and three branches of the lampstand from the other side. There were three cups shaped like almond blossoms, each with a bud and petals on one branch and three cups shaped like almond blossoms, each with a bud and petal on the next branch. It was this way for six branches that extended from the lampstand. There were four cups shaped like almond blossoms on the lampstand shaft along with its buds and petals. For the six branches that extended from it, a bud was under the first pair of branches from it. A bud under the second pair of branches from it and a bud under the third pair of branches from it. Their buds and branches were one piece with it all of it was a single hammered piece of pure gold. He also made its seven lamps, snuffers, and fire pans of pure, pure gold. He made it and all of its utensils of 75 pounds of pure gold. So does anybody remember what the meaning of the almond blossom is? No. It's a hearkening back to life. It's that visible representation of goodness and fertility and life. Okay. The newness. When do we see almond blossoms in spring? What's significant about spring? New. It's in renewal. Mm-hmm in the created order yes so when when thinking about the lampstand have you guys seen the lampstand pictures of the lampstand it's pretty mm -hmm. pretty remarkable and really beautiful um if you've never looked at it you should google it and just see what it looks like oftentimes lampstands are seen in stained glass windows they're very common in a lot of churches because it's um rather ornate and really beautiful and the meaning is really significant too. Okay, the last we have is the altar of incense. So he made the altar of incense out of acacia wood. It was square, 18 inches long and 18 inches wide. It was 36 inches high. It, its horns were of one piece. He overlay, overlaid it its top all around its sides and its horns with pure gold. Then he made a gold molding all around it. He made two gold rings for it under the molding on two of its sides. He put these on opposite sides of it to be holders for the poles to carry. He made the poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold. He also made the holy anointing oil and the pure, fragrant, and expertly blended incense. Okay. It would be so nice if they had inserted pictures. Oh, I know. How about that? Um, can you kind of imagine it in your head, though? Uh -huh. It's comfort too, isn't it? You no, know, it's it sounds beautiful, um, but it's I cannot totally envision it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know it is kind of hard to envision, but what's important is that, you know, all of this was done for God's glory. And what we're seeing here again is just the care and the intention that was taken in order for these, um, this worship space, as well as everything that you use to worship with, were done in the best possible way. There's, oh. a, there's a lamp stand, and it kind of gives you a idea on the size. See the proportion. 
looks huge. Oh, that's a, that is a person. Yes, that's a person lighting a candle. That's a priest, yeah. Now, is that not similar to the candles that the Hebrews use? It's the... Yeah. The menorah? The menorah. Yeah, it's the, yeah. It's the beginning of the menorah. Thank the you. Of them all. And well, I'm sorry. And what was when you were doing the 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 table? Mm -hmm. well, the angel, um, the the ark. Um, are you asking? What are you asking? Oh, the the table of the showbread. Yeah, showbread. Yeah. Okay, so that's um like a modern day altar yeah and what was on it um so on it were um the utensils and they were made out of pure gold plates cups as well as bowls and pitchers for the drink offerings that would happen yeah these pictures are too small where were the cherubims the guardian angels oh uh, they were the two stacks on each side right with the wings yep like protecting them the, yep. the box <laughs> yeah and remember what is the cherubim a throwback to do you guys remember the first time we saw a cherubim no oh uh, it was what's So remember when Adam and Eve were thrown out of the garden, there were angels that were oh, um, yeah. on um, the outside of the garden. Do you guys remember why they were there? Uh -huh. So they couldn't get back in. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> For protection. Yep. So as as um, guardians, right? Yeah, yeah, they they messed up and you're you've lost your chance. And so God placed um, the, the cherubim at the entrance of the garden so that they could not get back in. Trying to find one that shows a proportion for the table, but these aren't very good. Well, here's one with, yeah. Can you hold it up? That's oh, about the look big. at that. Yeah. Wow. And it, can, it can be yours for $11,500. Oh, I'll take you. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. That's... Where did you get it? I'm not sure where that one's from. The other one, I think, was from Marshall Field. <laughs> <laughs> you can have your own table. It was a shoe brand. I don't know if you guys can see this, but here's another rendition. This one's brass. Yeah. Yeah. That, okay. That's, but see, it shows somebody with it. So, yeah. So it shows the priest. Yeah. And it shows the bread. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's, and so, now, isn't that the poles that you would carry that with? Yes. Yes. So, what what is it a constant reminder of? God's everlasting covenant with his people. Mm -hmm. That was a constant reminder. In addition, um, you know, the <clears throat> God's provision for them. Mm -hmm. And that image is translated into Jesus as well, because how many times does Jesus refer to bread to describe himself or uses bread as a way of teaching? Um, so it's a very important um, metaphor. Um, and this is where it started. So, um, And again, it's inside the holy place. It's in the tabernacle. So it was situated on the north side of the holy place. And it was situated in a private area where who was allowed to go in? Anybody? No. No, no just the priests. That's the priests were allowed to enter and they were... Um, able to kind of perform their daily rituals um, as being representatives for the people, right? 
So we know the description, lots of acacia wood, lots of gold. Remember, um, God is the one who does the instruction on all of these buildings. So on top of the table, we have 12 loaves of bread made from fine flour, it's the bread of the presence. The loaves were arranged in two rows or six mm -hmm. piles of bread. So how many in total? 12, 12. one for each tribe. Yep, hearkening back to the 12 tribes of Israel. Um, frankincense was sprinkled on each row. So just like with consecrated bread, the show bread was considered to be holy. Why? Because it's an offering to God um, and could only be eaten by who? The priests. Priest. Each week on the day that is set aside known as Sabbath, the priests consumed the old bread and replaced it with fresh loaves and frankincense that was um, supplied by the Israelite people. One thing, uh, uh, somebody that I will get that then, oh, I, uh, I can't talk. Uh, 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 one uh, day, uh, I will do it for you. Oh, right. Do this in remembrance of me. Yes. It's yes. a, it's a mm -hmm. callback. Yes. It's, and yes, it's directly related to communion now. Right. Uh -huh. So we're, we partake of consecrated bread. It's just not set aside for me. Is it? No, it's for everybody now. Mm -hmm. Um, Again, who was who was able to consume the showbread? The priests. Only the priests, yeah. Mm -hmm. And remember, it was 12 loaves for the 12 tribes of Israel. Mm -hmm. Frankincense sprinkled in between. And the priests consumed the leftover bread on the day of Sabbath. Okay. Mm -hmm. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah. So basically, it's a table with bread on top. And again, it is a reminder, a hearkening back to God's provision for Israel. And it's a call back to the covenant. Very, very, very important. And where was it placed? In the northern part of the tabernacle. And only the priests were allowed to see it. They were the representatives. Okay. Okay, so we have the lampstands, Susie. Yeah. It's very similar to what you showed, right? But it's, it's high. It's not something you put on a table. No, 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 no. The big old lampstand in that. Big, yeah. And again, let's see. Yeah, they all pretty much look about the same, don't they? Yeah, they have yeah. The, the the seven across, mm -hmm. seven candle holders. Yep. So it's kind of like in the shape of a tree, reminding reminding us, hearkening back to God's greatness and His power. So if it, if it kind of looks like a tree, what is that hearkening back to? The Garden of Eden, right? Tree of life. Yeah, 
yes, very good. The tree of life. It's um, not kind of too um, too far of um, a stretch that we see the cherubims kind of sprinkled throughout it, right? It's really quite beautiful and it's really quite big, Susie, as you mm -hmm. said. Um, so, and it had, it served a very practical purpose too, as a lampstand in a dark tabernacle with, you know, tapestries and, and um, darkness. Pure gold. Can you imagine how much it weighed? <laughs> <laughs> but it's going to serve, it's going to probably put out quite a bit of light too, huh? Yeah. Yes. So, um, do you guys remember last week we talked about where did all this gold come from? The Egyptians. Yeah. Yeah. It was acquired. Yes, it was. Yeah. So it's really interesting. Those who held um, the Israelites in bondage for so many years, um, when they left Egypt, they took with them their gold, and now their gold is basically creating these worship spaces for the one true God who actually delivered them, right, out of Egypt. <clears throat> so, um, so the practical function was to provide light, and of course it was quite beautiful, but it also represented um, the light and life that um, God gives to um, the people of God. And how are we mindful of that? Remember on every baptism day, what is one mm -hmm. of the last things that the priest hands to the parents? Candle. Captures, yeah, captures the baby's attention like no other. It's the candle. And what do I say? You are the light of Christ. You know, the light of Christ shines, shines brightly within you. So it says here, um, it was 75 pounds of pure gold. Mm. And remember the, the um, almond blossoms were part of it. So one of the things, if you're going to have a lamp in a tabernacle, and this is really significant to me as a priest, um, does it ever go out? No. No, it shouldn't go out because why? What does it mean? It means that God is present, right? That God is the light of the world. And we too have something similar to that in our sanctuary. And what is that? We have a golden lamp stand. Yeah. It's called the sanctuary lamp or the Christ candle, right? I bet it's brass. Yeah. <laughs> Kings above the tabernacle, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's a visible reminder that Christ's presence is with us. And the saddest day of the year for me is always on Monday, Thursday, when that lamp is extinguished, right? Because when the lamp is extinguished, what does that mean? Jesus is no longer here. Yeah. He's dead. Well, I got Sad seven day. candles. What's that? That's why we get seven day candles. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I wish ours stayed lit a lot more than what it does, but it's, um, yeah, it's sometimes lit and sometimes not, but my preference is for it to stay lit for this very reason. Yeah. So the golden lampstand is an opposite to the table of showbread. So the golden lamp lampstand is actually on the south side of the tabernacle in the holy place. Um, and because that particular part of the tabernacle did not have any light coming in, no windows, the lampstand was the only source of light. So pretty important. <coughs> and eventually this same lampstand was used in synagogues and temples. And like you said, Susie, its name became the menorah. And are they still used in traditional Jewish worship today? Yes. Yeah. Yes. 
Yeah. yeah. So on the outside, if you recognize or if you remember, on the outside of the tent, things were made of bronze. Okay. But on the inside of the tent, what were they made of? Gold. Yes. Yeah. And what would that symbolize? Like we're going to have the best for God, right? Holiness, goodness, the best for God. So again, on the lampstand, what is the tree blossoms that we have on it? Almonds. Yes. So the almond tree, it blooms very early in the Middle East, very early in the Middle East. And maybe, I think it's either January or February when it blooms. And so it's one of the first bloomers to remind us again of what? Life. I don't know if you guys remember, but we haven't gotten to this yet, but there's a story in Numbers where Aaron's staff actually bloomed. Yeah. <laughs> It budded, bloomed, and what did it produce? Almonds. Almonds. Yeah. And they so could smell them. <laughs> yeah. And that's one of the reasons why he was chosen as a high priest. And that rod was eventually put into the Ark of the Covenant, which was right. kept in the, the tabernacle. And what is it? Always a reminder of God's faithfulness and God's presence mm -hmm. with us. So again, the golden lampstand is in the shape of a tree and that's a hearkening back to what? The Garden of Eden and the tree of life, right? With the golden lampstand, we know that God is the one who gives life, nobody else. And that is as typologists, when people talk about Jesus being the light of the world, when we are told that we are the light of the world, this isn't just an image that's made up or pulled out of oh. thin air, is it? All the way back to the beginning. Mm -hmm. And if you know your Bible, you can say, oh my gosh, I've heard that before. That is the lampstand in the tabernacle. Oh. That's where it comes from. Because remember, Jesus doesn't speak unless it's really already been spoken about before. Uh -huh. He quotes the prophets. He knows the Old Testament like no other. So he's not going to be using images that he pulls out of the air and have no meaning. Everything has meaning, right? Uh -huh. And if we know where the meaning comes from, it's just so much richer, isn't it? Uh -huh. Uh-huh. In the dark tabernacle, the lampstand is the only source of light. And Jesus is calling us that too. We are the light of the world. Don't hide it under a bushel. No. Yeah. I'm gonna let it shine, right? Right. How many of us learned that when we were like four years old? <laughs> this little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I'm gonna have to go. I've got nook duty. So Hey, have fun, Susie. Okay. Oh, yeah, I will. Tell everybody. Bye -bye. Hope you enjoyed it. I did. And very much. Good, good, good. Glad you were here. Yes. So does that kind of make a little bit more sense, kind of fleshing it out a little bit? Is that helpful? Absolutely. It is yes. for me to be reminded of these things and to, to remember as people... Um, um, as people who are trying to live as followers of Jesus, this narrative is leading straight to him. Even what is going on inside of the tabernacle. Suzanne. Was before he came. I have a question. Certainly. 
do you have or is there an indication at how long did it take from the beginning of starting to build the tabernacle or the altar until it was finished? Uh, are we talking months, years? I think it was done fairly quickly, Teddy. I don't think it was a long process. I know the temple took years, like decades to build it. That is not so with the tabernacle. This was probably constructed, I don't know, in, in a month, in a couple of months, maybe at the most a year. It well, wasn't thinking, long, it was not a long time. Well, I'm, I'm thinking of all the carving and the molding and the forming, uh, but they had this God-given gift for uh, that trade. Yes. <laughs> Yes. whichever he was doing or she or they were yes. doing yes and they also had a lot of material to work with so all the material along with these really skilled artisans and very specific instructions from god i personally am of the like mind that says this did not take long to do it was not a process of decades this was no. quickly I think so, too. Yeah, I do. I really do believe it. Well, does any of this remain any place? Mm -mm. None no. of it. No. No, that's why it's important that we read it, you know. And that's why it's important, I think, to make the connections between these ancient places of worship to our current places of worship and how similar they are. Mm -hmm. um, and grace has really recreated its own, you know, place of worship that is modeled on um, how it was back in the day. Because a lot of our um, articles and utensils for worship, this is where it all comes from. Yes, yes, yes. Again, it's just not pulled out of the air. It's just not like Henry VIII made it up. So let's have a sanctuary. Like, no, <laughs> no. I mean, it it's back. It goes back to the lampstand. It's. I think it's really helpful to have to have this kind of information in your wheelhouse, um, so that when you walk into a worship space maybe it's a bit more familiar or you can, you, you understand the purpose of it being there. And that I think enriches worship, draws yes. you closer yes. to God. Yes. When you understand that there is a light that never goes out in the worship space, represents yes. God's eternal presence. Oh my gosh, that's so comforting, isn't it? Powerful yes. when you walk into a nave and you see the Christ light burning, man, you don't even have to say any words just by looking at it. You know, Jesus uh -huh. is here, right? Absolutely. And that's the really cool thing about being a liturgical church is that we have so many representations of God in our midst. I wish more people understood it. I wish more people would be interested in it um, because I think it, it would really kind of um, light a fire for a lot of people because it did for me, it's, it's enriched my life in a very, very deep way. Okay, how's that? Boy, we ate a lot of rabbits today, didn't we? But it was fun, oh. fun, fun, fun. Okay, so we will pick up. Oh, we're not gonna have a Bible study next week because it's Thanksgiving week, right? So we'll come back after Thanksgiving, okay? Good. And I'll be sure to mention that in um, the email this coming week, okay? All right, I'm gonna pray you guys out and um, say have a great week. I'll see you guys, well, I'll see you Thursday, Teddy. Thursday. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am, okay. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Gracious God, thank you for this time. 
thank you for these inquiring and um, curious minds. Lord, may we never lose that desire to know you better and love you more. We ask all of this in your son's name, Jesus. Amen. Y'all have a great day. Thank you. You too. You too. Bye, bye. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. Uh huh. All right.
Garden annual tree program. If you'd like to donate, grab your phone, point the camera at the QR code on your screen. It'll take you to our webpage, a place to donate toys or cash. All right. Well, It's time for a new shower, but you don't want the hassle. You just want it done. Rebath, from start to sell. Call us or visit rebath.com and save $500 of your shelter shower update. Since the season for getting together, what? Go on here, see your old all 50 tour days get new boards in time for the holidays. With 60% off all carpet, hardwood, vinyl, and lavender. Skip the holiday crap. Can you see the new home? Is your pocket turn loaded? Great time for savings for Paul Day. 60% off.
Thank you.